All right. Well, good morning. We have another little rainstorm kind of moving in. We've had that for several weeks now. Um, but I'm excited to share with you this morning. Uh, before I get into it, just a couple of things. Anybody, anybody that's just really ready for this time to be over and, and get back to doing some things that you used to do, uh, I know that I am. I'm, I'm anxiously waiting for the day that they say, okay, you can go do this again. Now you can do that. And I, have you even thought about what the first thing is that you look forward to doing when uh, the band is lifted or the, the freedom is given back to us to go back to some sense of life as usual? Have you thought about what that first thing would be? I, I know I have. I'm going to tell you what it is. The first thing that I am looking forward to is coming into this place together with all our friends and family and brothers and sisters in the Lord and come together and just worship and fellowship and pray and just rejoice. And, and, uh, and I'm just looking forward to that. I, I don't know about you. I, I hope that you are. Um, I'm missing it uh, deeply. But there is one thing, one thing that uh, uh, kind of uh, precedes that for me, and that is a haircut. I'm really looking forward to going and getting a haircut. So I don't know about you, I don't know how many of you are feeling like, man, <laughs> it's way past due, or, or some of you ladies are waiting to go get your hair done or something like that. Well, uh, hopefully and prayerfully, that time is going to come. Uh, once again, before we get into this this morning, I, I just want to uh, give some thanks out to uh, one Peter Blosser. Uh, Peter has been uh, just carrying us through this time, leading the technology team uh, or the tech team, um, and uh, just whether we were preparing last week for outdoor or right in here today online, all the things he's always the backbone of that. But this morning. Uh, Richard Fritz is serving back there on the team. This is his Sunday. Uh, Will Boucher is uh, working with us today. I think Natalie's back there. I can't see you, Natalie, but I think you're, there you are. Okay. So thank you guys for serving and, and always thankful to the worship team and to Jeremiah and all the people just behind the scenes that help us bring these, these times together. Let's pray and we're going to get started this morning. Father, I am thankful that nothing stops you. And so, Lord, today, here we are, once again, able to worship you, able to just proclaim your word, your truth, Lord, able to stand in your presence. And so, Lord, I, I pray that whether it's in here in this place or in our homes, wherever we are today, Lord God, that, that we will open our hearts to you. Lord, that we will be sensitive to your presence and that we will have ears open to your word and that we will have hearts that desire and long to live in the reality of the truths that you want us to know and to understand. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. We are going to begin a series in 1 Peter so over the next few times together, we're going to be in 1 Peter. Um, I want to I begin not at the very beginning. We're going to kind of skip the first two verses. We may come back to them sometime later. But uh, I want to read for you uh, in chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. But I'm going to leave a few parts out. So uh, it's not going to be on the screen for you right now. Don't open it up and read it. I just want you to listen, and I want you to think about this, but just know that I'm going to leave just a few parts out. So here it is. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10 through 12, with some missing parts. We'll begin with these people called prophets. The prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. They made careful search and inquiry, seeking to know, dot, dot, dot. We're going to leave out some verses. 
Then we're going to pick up right here. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but they were serving you in these things. Dot, dot, dot. Things into which angels long to look. Interesting. Things, these things. Something or these things captured the fascination of these men of old and the curiosity of angels. That's interesting. Prophets searched and angels longed to look. Well, I want you to think about this for just a minute while I turn there really quick myself to 1 Peter. So I have it. Prophets, they were looking forward to these things. They were making, there's three words here that just uh, accentuate what they're doing. One is they make careful search and inquiry, seeking to know something, all three of those words, search, inquiry, seeking. What, where were they doing this searching? Well, they would have been doing it in the Old Testament scriptures. They were looking into God's word. So these are men of old prior to our generation. And they were searching for something. They, they, were, they were interested in something. They were fascinated with something and and so, but then it, it comes along and it tells us that angels, they were interested in something here too. They were longing to look at these things, not as a future thing. They were longing to look at these things in the present as it was happening. Hmm, that word long. These angels long to look. That, that word is a very specific word. It's a word that, that means not just kind of a passing interest, but a deep, intense yearning, okay, uh, to see this thing happen. Whatever it was, whatever this thing was, it was a very, very strong desire for the angels to, to be looking over. And, and that word, there's that word long, and then there's also this word look, they long to look into these things, okay? This word look basically means to watch with deep interest and curiosity as, a, as, as an outsider. Not someone who was actually going to get to experience this. Not someone who was waiting and anticipating for this to happen to them. Because whatever the angels were looking at, they were an outsider. They were an observer watching, yet with such intensity and with such longing and desire. Something that, that grabbed their hearts. And so it, it's interesting to me that... When you think of angels, you know, and I don't know what you think about angels, but I think that angels are a curious sort. They are not mindless, emotionless, disinterested beings that God created just to do service for him. They actually want to understand what God is doing in the earth. And they're interested in seeing what God is doing unfold this, this great drama that takes place down here. So I have a question for us this morning, getting into this. <laughs> what is it that makes angels so curious and makes these men of old give such careful search and inquiry? The answer is your salvation and mine. Wow. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you a couple more questions. Are you as curious as the angels? 
about your salvation, something they don't even get to experience. Something that's not for them, yet they're deeply longing to see this thing happen. Are you as curious as angels about your own salvation? And second question, are you as inquiring and searching and seeking as these prophets of old? Something that they didn't get to experience in their lifetime. Something that they had to wait, that had to, that was for another generation. Your generation, our generation. Well, let's fill in the blanks. First Peter 1, 10 through 12. Let's look at them again and let's fill in the, the full picture so that we know what it was that these angels, these men of old, were so fascinated with, so amazed by, so interested in, so curious about. Verse 10 says this, as to this salvation, that's what it was. That's what they were interested in. This salvation. As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. So think about it. It's about salvation, but it's about grace that God wants to bring to you and to me and to our generation. And so as to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful search and inquiry, seeking to know. This is what they were seeking. They wanted to know something. They wanted to know what person or time the spirit of Christ within them, the spirit within them, and it wasn't just the Holy Spirit, it was the Holy Spirit, but he, he gives them the title, the spirit of Christ. Christ means Messiah, the expected one to come. So, so here it is, to, to know the person or the time. They were interested in the who and when. When is this gonna happen? Is it gonna happen in our time? The prophets thought it was gonna happen in their time. They were diligently searching in the Old Testament scriptures, the prophecies and all the stuff. When, when is this going to happen? And it says this, that they were seeking to know the person or time that the spirit within them, the spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted in other words, it wasn't the prophets who were predicting, it was the Spirit of Christ in the prophets that was predicting two things, the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. The sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. Now think about that for just a minute. The Old Testament and the prophets spoke often of this coming one that was gonna bring salvation to the world, the Messiah, the Christ, the one that everyone was waiting for. And it spoke of his sufferings, but it also spoke of the glories to follow. What were those sufferings? We know them looking back now in the New Testament. We know that those sufferings, you know, it, it, it began with, with, uh, with rejection. He was rejected by his own people. And then he was, he was uh, forsaken, or he was betrayed by one of his dearest, closest friends that led him to, to be taken away by the, by the Romans. And then third, he was rejected by all of, or, or uh, forsaken, I should say, by all of his disciples. And then he was scourged and crucified on a cross. That's a lot of suffering, to be abandoned by all your friends, everyone, you're left totally alone. That was Jesus. And then he had to suffer the most intense, horrific death ever. I'm glad the story doesn't end there, that it's not just about the sufferings that were to come, but it's about the glories that were to follow. Because the glories start with the resurrection. I mean, there were some glorious things even before the resurrection. We could say the birth of Christ, the incarnation. We could say his, his transfiguration. We could say a lot of things. But his resurrection started a whole new course, a whole new trajectory. The resurrection. Then 
his exaltation or, or, his re, or his ultimate return to this earth to come and, and get his people. And then finally, his ultimate reign in heaven where his kingdom will reign forevermore. Those are glorious things to follow. You say, oh, that's all about him. Is there anything in there about me? Hey, we're actually gonna see that there are things in there about you and me that all of this was done for. So let's, let's begin to take a look at that. Um, but, <laughs> um, yeah, we'll just, we'll just move on. I'm gonna jump past a couple of things. So let's turn to uh, chapter 1, ver- beginning in verse 3. Beginning in verse 3, it says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when you read something like that, does that just sound like flower, flowery, wordy stuff? Blessed be, you know, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to stop right there and I want to ask questions like, why? Why do we want to bless the God and the Father of Jesus? Well, I, I mean, I, we could answer, we could give a Sunday school answer, but is there a reason for you and I to get pretty excited? Maybe the same way the angels did, maybe the same way the men of, and women of old did as they were expecting, looking forward to this future event. It's interesting, by the way, that the angels, they weren't looking forward to a future event. They are presently observing and watching with still this longing, seeking to fully understand what God is doing in the earth with us. To me, that's a pretty amazing thing. I, I don't know about you, I wanna have that same passion If somebody's gonna have passion and excitement and enthusiasm for me, I better have it, right? So a generation that precedes me, beings that aren't even like me can be as excited about this. I need to be excited about this. So I ask the question, why? Why should we bless the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? We already got the answer. Because of this salvation. But in the verse three, he says it like this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy. Great. When you think of great, do you just think great mercy? Or do you think of great mercy? Mercy. Because of his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. Not a physical birth, but a spiritual birth. To be born again to, and I should have said this, by the way, before I, before I even answer this right here. This salvation that you and I should be so excited about is expressed in these next few verses in three ways, and I want to go ahead and give them to you. They are hope, faith, and love. So this salvation that you and I should be experiencing, this salvation that you and I should be pretty excited about, that we should be just as eagerly digging into God's word to understand it so that we live it to its fullest, to be like angels who are not only looking in as an outsider uh, of our own salvation, but, but you and I can be looking with that same fascination, that same curiosity. Is, is he gonna believe? Is she gonna believe? Are they gonna come to understand? Are they gonna experience this same mercy, this same salvation? See, that's what you and I That's how alive this needs to be in us. So we're gonna look at this salvation as as it's expressed in hope, faith, and love. And so here he's beginning to give us the first one. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a, here's the word, a living hope. A living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 
man, I can stop right there and I'm just like, all of a sudden, you, know, you can ask yourself the question, it's not just hope, it's a living hope. Why is it a living hope? Well, it's a living hope because at least two things. One is, there's been a birth, and birth brings life. And he says in here that we've been born again. Because of his great mercy, God has caused us, his people, to be born again, new life in Christ. So this, this, this hope that, that we have comes via this new life that comes from being born of God. But then secondly, he follows it up, uh, he chases it with the resurrection. He says, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Had Jesus remained in the grave, there, that hope would be dead. I don't know about you, I don't want a dead hope. I want a living hope. The one that has a reality behind it. One, one that I can cling to, grab onto. It's not wishful thinking. It is so my confidence is so strong in it, it's alive in me. This hope is supposed to be alive in us, living in you and I. So, a living hope, but he goes on to say that this living hope is to obtain, what is, what are, what is the hope in, <laughs> okay? So, this living hope is to obtain, verse 4, an inheritance. So, we have this hope of a future inheritance. The hope is present future. It's present in, a, in something in the future. But when we come to this part, this, this, to obtain an inheritance, this inheritance is future. But I want you to look at the characteristics of this inheritance. He says that we are to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled and unfading reserved in heaven for you. That's three, three powerful characteristics of this inheritance. It's imperishable. It will never perish. It is undefiled. Nothing, it's, it's, it's perfect. There's nothing impure in it. There's nothing defiling in it. Um, and then it's unfading. It won't lose its glory. Now think about every inheritance that you and I have in this life or everything that our heart desires. A, a, a new car, a new kitchen appliance, a chair or a sofa in the living room. I, I, don't, I don't know what your thing is, a new tennis rack. I, I don't know what it is that your heart desires and craves or some inheritance that you're going to be, that's going to be passed down to you. But here's one of the things I can tell you about any earthly inheritance. Whatever gift we have, whatever thing that we've acquired, first of all, it's, it's going to perish. And it perishes in our presence. It doesn't perish after we're gone. You know, we always hear you can't take it with you when you're gone. That may be true. But you know what? You can't even keep it while you're here because it starts perishing the day you get it. Well, I don't, I don't care if it's a can of food. Uh, I, I don't care if it's a thing that you've bought. It's going to degenerate over time. Secondly, it's not perfectly undefiled. Whatever you get, it, it doesn't have, it's not perfect. You get it and you start looking at it and go, oh man, I thought it was going to be whatever that thing, is, and it comes up short just a little bit. And then third, every day after you have that thing, it begins to fade in its glory. I, you pick the thing, whatever it was, the day you got it was the, the day it was the most glorious. But every day after that, it just loses kind of the law of diminishing returns. It just starts losing its glory a little bit over time. And after a while, it, it doesn't bring the same level of satisfaction. It's just not as exciting as it once was. Wow. Well, I know this, that the inheritance that you and I have, and we have a living hope as believers in that inheritance, I know three things about it. It's imperishable. Not one 
it's going to be just as, as powerful uh, day one in eternity as it will be five million years into eternity, five billion, five trillion, what's after a trillion? I don't know, a quazillion or a multifliction. I can't even make up a word. So whatever that thing is, there will never be one ounce of perishing in that inheritance. Secondly, it will, think about it, there's nothing. We won't look at it and go, oh, it looks so beautiful on this side. I didn't look around the back side. I didn't realize that this thing that he was giving me you know, had a little bit of a facade. No, it's, it's pure, it's undefiled. And finally, it's unfading. It won't lose its glory over time, any part in, inherit, in, in eternity. Where is, this, where is this inheritance? It says it's reserved for us in a good place. Where? In heaven. But look at the personal words. It's reserved in heaven for you. That's what your living hope is in. So that's the first one. The second one is faith. And it's just, as there was a living hope, there is a proving faith. Look at verse five. So he says, the end of verse four, this inheritance is reserved in heaven for you. Who, the who is you and I, and all God's people, who are protected by the power of God. Protected by the power of God. Man, that's that's great right from the get-go, but notice this. We're protected by the power of God, but there's a means. There's something required of us. We are protected by the power of God through faith. Through faith, that's our active part, our believing, our trusting in him. Who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So this salvation that we're talking about is not present, it's still future. Because this salvation is now understood as this inheritance when we, when we experience the fullness of it. So that future is when Jesus comes back or when Jesus ends this life and we, we are shuttled quickly to his presence. Verse six, in this you greatly rejoice. What do we greatly rejoice in? We greatly rejoice in this salvation ready to be revealed to us uh, and, and that we're protected by the power of God, we have this great inheritance. We should rejoice in that. Angels rejoice. Do you know what it says? It says that in, in, in Luke 15, it says that angels, when one sinner repents, angels get all giddy. They get excited. They rejoice in that. Do we rejoice in that? Do, is my salvation, at least my hope of salvation, is it fading in glory every day? Was it real exciting when it first began, but now as days go by, I've lost some of that joy, that excitement? He's saying that should not diminish. In this, you greatly rejoice, even though... Okay, here comes reality. You go, Bo, you're talking non-reality. Life just isn't like that. Okay, well, here's what life is like. Verse six, in this you greatly rejoice, even though now, just for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. Anybody (laughs) felt distressed? maybe a lot lately, not just one big distressing moment because of the coronavirus, but probably many, many micro distressing moments and and experiences you weren't expecting through this. And not just that, when this is all past and gone, this is still going to be true. That for a little while, while we're here on this earth, there will be various trials that will come to test our faith. Verse seven says this, that the proof of your faith, so we call the proving of our faith, that the proof of your faith being more precious 
than gold, which is perishable. Oh my gosh, here we are. There's, there's an example of gold. Gold is not 100% pure. It's, it's, it's got impurities in it. It's defiled. So what, is, what do they do? They, they put it in fire and a furnace and they refine it. They try to get the impurities out. But even once they've done, you can't get it all out. He says here, the proof of our faith, something different. Our faith, the proof of it is more precious, it's more valuable than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire. Even though that gold's been tested by fire. Even though your, your new slick car, your, 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 your new, give me something, <laughs> stereo. We, nobody gets stereos anymore. Um, I don't know. Whatever the thing is right now that's important to you, even though those things have been tested by found, may be found to result, what will be found to result? Our faith, proven faith, that it's strong, that it's strong in the power of God, and in that we find protection, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor of the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, trials test the metal of our faith. And we should rejoice in that living hope, even though trials come, because God protects us in the midst of those trials if we cling to him and hold to him in faith. And that faith will be tested. It's being tested daily. It's being tested in big ways and small ways. But we are to not lose hope and we are to not give up and lose faith. This leads us to our third um, expression of salvation that he talks about here in verse eight. And I love this one. And though you have not seen him, though you've not seen who? You've not seen Jesus. He just finished verse seven talking about the revealing of Jesus Christ when he comes again in one of the glories to follow when Jesus comes again. It says, and though you've not seen him, you and I have not seen him with our physical eyes. But though you've not seen him, you love him. You love him. How can you love that which you've not seen? Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, in this moment, this generation, but believe in him, though you don't see him now, but you believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Wow. Knowing love, living hope, proving faith, And knowing love, knowing Jesus, loving him by faith, believing in him, we experience him, his presence. Just like we saw before, the spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit in those who preach the gospel, that same spirit dwells within us. That's where that new birth comes from. Just to kind of bring closure to this, I want you to notice a word. Even though we've not seen him, we love him. I think because he loves us first. And though we've not seen him now, but believe in him, we greatly rejoice with the, here's the words, joy inexpressible. Inexpressible. What does that mean? I, I can't express it. It's a joy so deep that all my expression falls short of what's really I'm experiencing inside. Now, that doesn't mean that we walk walk away like we're stoic. There should be some emotion. There should be some passion. There should be some joy. But I know 
that in the times that we live this life for a little while, there are gonna be various trials. There are gonna be things that test our faith. But if we continue to, to, to prove our faith and to believe in him and to love him through that, that all of those things, that living hope of what I know, that inheritance that I have coming, this life, whatever it is, but that next life. And for now, that faith that protects me. And then third, that love, that encounter, that relationship with him. Those three things are finally, then verse nine says this, and ultimately, the obtaining as the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. What's the big point? The big point is living hope (laughs) leads to proving faith, leads to knowing love. But more importantly, it's this. We are to live our lives in the light of our future salvation. Whatever we get the privilege of experiencing right now in these now moments that, that we take delight in, that we take joy in, That's one thing. But it's living our daily life in light of our future salvation, the future revealing of Jesus when he returns, the future inheritance, all of those things. That's what it's all about. So let me pray. Father, I thank you for such tremendous, tremendous blessings. And we bless you, the Father and Lord, the Father and God of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for that living hope. We thank you for all the gifts, all the inheritance, all the power, all the protection, all the testing, all the joy and ultimately the blessing of being in your presence and loving Jesus and rather being loved by him. And we pray this in Jesus' name and we thank you. Amen. I'm gonna try something this week for five days, Monday through Friday, seven o'clock, somewhere between seven and eight in the morning. Uh, I'm going to try to do something I'm just calling morning minutes, and it's five minutes or less. And we're gonna go over just a small little devotional point of the day, pray for you, hope that you can connect, hope that it helps us as we continue to walk through these things. And we'll see you Tuesday night for Pray Live at 6.30. Check into your Zoom groups, and we'll see you next Sunday. Hopefully see you in the morning.